Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass. So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Welcome to episode 231 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I would like to say thanks to some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Jessica Watson, Colin Herman, Katie Lochran, Kay Merck, Elaine, Janet Cowan, Christine Rea, and Sarah Owen. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. I always feel like every time I do the Patreon names, I just feel like I sound like the the woman who does the voiceovers for the British MasterChef. You know, and maybe maybe if it all goes tits up a podcast and that's a career that I could consider. And our film review this week, our film review is Grabbers. Grabbers was released in 2012. It has 6.3 out of 10 on IMDb and 70% on Rotten Tomatoes. Police officer Lisa Nolan comes to Arran Island in Ireland to take charge during a colleague's two-week holiday. Simultaneously, bloodthirsty sea-dwelling aliens arrive at the quiet island to propagate. As dead whales wash up on shore and people start mysteriously disappearing, officers and a few locals slowly discover their peril along with one sure defence. High blood alcohol levels, which the aliens can't stomach. As a storm approaches, enabling hungry hatchlings access to the locals, an open bar kicks off a desperate bid for survival, as inebriated police and friends stagger to remain cognizant long enough to thwart the alien invasion. So as always, we're going to go for our likes and dislikes for this film. And let's start with the likes. So I love an Irish film that has actual Irish actors. Granted, the main police officer is an Englishman, but he does a very good Irish accent, so I'll forgive him. But actual Irish actors and a film that is written by actual Irish people is a big plus for me. I really loved the script for this film. It is very, very funny, but in the most understated way. There are great little moments of really dry humour and wit and great little throwaway jokes that I just loved. I loved. And I was watching this at like nine o'clock in the morning, watching, you know, big tentacled aliens wreaking havoc and loving my little life. And the film really has all of the great creature feature tropes. So you've got a dejected police officer. He's an alcoholic. His life is really difficult. He's not really in his job anymore. You know, he's only there in body, not in spirit. You have this fresh faced guard from the big city who comes along and is is really dedicated to their job, etc. Oh, and by the way, I keep saying guard. Guard is police officer in Ireland. Then you've got... The eccentric locals, you know, the people who nobody's going to believe. The lads who are like, I've got a, I've got a fucking alien in my bathtub. And everyone's like, yeah, sure, sure, Porrick, I'm sure that you do. It's got that brilliant opening sequence that most creature features have where you see people who are going about their daily business and they get eaten, consumed, mangled by this creature, whatever it is. And then we cut to the lovely scenery of the Aran Islands. Although I do think it was actually filmed in Donegal. But, you know, still beautiful scenery. In the beginning, I felt like this film did really well not to show the monster. You guys know how I feel about that. You show the monster too early and it it's not very scary. And CGI can only carry you so far. And I felt like this film was acutely aware of that. So there was lots of people being, like, dragged off into oblivion. Whipped off into the sky 
by something tentacles that you can't see. Lots of people looking in horror and shock and screaming, which is a really good way of getting around not having a giant CGI budget. And Russell Tovey is in this film. If you don't know who Russell Tovey is, give him a Google and you look at his face and go, oh yeah, him. He's in this film. I really like him as an actor. I, I have big respect for him. And he's clearly having a great time in this. He plays this English marine biologist who is living on the island studying the animals, etc, etc. And he just, he's obviously having a great time. His character is completely ridiculous. And also really fun to watch. And I love watching actors when you can tell they definitely had a really good time filming this. And I think this film feels like everyone had a really good time filming it. So this is my official thank you to everybody who has told me to watch this film for years. <laughs> Literally years people have been telling me to watch this film. And then I put up an anonymous question box on Instagram and somebody posted, you need to watch the film Grabbers. So thank you to whoever you were, anonymous person, to rejig my memory about everybody telling me to watch Grabbers. I will say I was incredibly dubious about watching this film. And the reason that I was apprehensive is that I was concerned about watching a film that was like the only way the Irish people on the island can survive is by being really drunk, which to me, I was like, oh, is this going to feed into really harmful stereotypes about Irish people? And I think sometimes it gets really frustrating when you see portrayals of Irish people in the media that are like, oh, they're drunk all the time and they love to fight and it's all diddly eye and everybody's a little bit backward and maybe a little bit stupid that that is frustrating to watch so I kind of when I started watching the film I was like please be good please please don't do this to me please don't feed into harmful stereotypes and actually I felt like it didn't and I think part of that was because the story was written by Irish people so to me it didn't feel problematic and actually reading about the making of this film the um, writer and the director was in maybe Thailand and he kept getting bitten by insects and mosquitoes and then somebody told him a rumor that if you ate loads of marmite the insects wouldn't find your blood attractive so they wouldn't bite you and then he got to thinking about what other things could you put in your blood to detract or to deter insects and he thought about drinking loads and would that deter insects and then he got to thinking about the story basically of the aliens being deterred by blood alcohol levels and I did see a review that was like, people always complained about the movie Signs. Why would the aliens go to a planet that was predominantly made up of water if water was their only <laughs> was their only downfall? And I feel the same way about this film, you know, that why would why would aliens go to Ireland if the only thing that could kill them was alcohol? And I was like, Oh, I don't know, maybe think before you write those things down <laughs> and think about why those stereotypes exist. Anyway, that's beside the point. It did not feel like it fed into harmful stereotypes. In fact, I actually thought it was more so a pastiche or a satire about the eccentric and quirky characters that sometimes you find in island communities and in all communities. That is what I felt like more so than it being like, haha, Irish people get drunk all the time. There is one thing I will say though, and I and I feel very strongly about this both on stage and on TV. I hate when people are acting as though they're drunk because often, often I think it, it's not very good. And I think there are some moments of not very good drunk acting in this film, which which made me which made me squint a little bit, you know, squint judgmentally. I was like, hmm. Does anybody ever really act like that when they're drunk? But I also understand that it's all in the name of comedy. So I need to get down off my high horse and just let it go. The other thing, which is slightly hypocritical to what I said earlier, you know, I said that the film has all of the great tropes, you know, dejected police officer, rookie guard who comes new and fresh face from the city and all of those things. It is very formulaic as a creature feature. You, There are no surprises, I would say. I think you do know as the viewer, where this story is going to go and what is going to happen next. So some people might find that a little bit off-putting. They might be like, oh, I want something new and exciting and out there. And you're not going to get that with this film. And look, here's the thing. I would say that it is fine. <laughs> that it is a good, solid film. It is not going to blow your mind, but it is definitely not a bad film. I think I'm going to give it three and a half stars. I think that seems reasonable and fair. If you're somebody who loves a creature feature and you want a fun 
film to watch, then I would, you know, I'd recommend it. It is, it's fun. It's not life changing, but it's fun. So that's three and a half stars for grabbers. Planning for your next trip? Elevate your travel style with Quince. Quince has all the jet setting essentials you'll want for your next getaway, like European linen, premium luggage options, buttery soft Italian leather bags, and so much more. And it's all priced at 50 to 80% less than similar brands. Plus, Quince only works with factories that use safe and ethical manufacturing practices. Pack your bags with high-quality essentials you'll be wearing for vacations to come with Quince. Go to quince.com slash pack for free shipping and 365-day returns. Hey there, it's Michelle Norris. I'm host of a podcast called Your Mama's Kitchen. When I travel, I'm usually looking for a way to find a taste of home when I'm not at home. And one of the things I love to do when I am at home is entertain. And Airbnb allows me to do that. When I was in California recently, I rented a house that had a great kitchen. And when we were sitting around the table, we're all thinking, we're in someone else's house. Someone could be in all of our homes as well. If you have a home, but you're not always at home, you have an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Which brings us to our story this week. Now, is our story about aliens who hate margaritas? No, it is not. Uh, This story is a fascinating little story that I was unaware of. And um, last week I was working and I was talking about premonitions with people. And James, hello James, if you are listening, who is a puppeteer that I've been working with, mentioned this book and this story and I immediately went out and bought it. So the book is called The Premonitions Bureau by Sam Knight. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is brilliantly written. It is fascinating. It's a great story. And the vast majority of the information for this episode comes from Sam Knight's work. So writings that he has done for various newspapers or from this book, The Premonitions Bureau. So let's get into the story. This week, I had a weird, quiet, premonitory experience. I had contacted a psychic in order to book in a reading. My friend had been to see him and had had a mind-blowing experience. And you best be sure that I wanted a piece of that action. I contacted the psychic and he said that he would get back to me on Monday when he was sorting out his diary. He did not. It wasn't until Wednesday that I realised that he hadn't called me back. I was sitting at my desk working and I suddenly had a thought that I hadn't heard back from him. And at that exact moment, my phone rang. It was him, ringing to organise an appointment. At the time, I was struck by the coincidence of it all, and then I got stuck into my editing and promptly forgot all about it. We've all had those moments of seeming premonition, when you think about a person and suddenly they call you out of the blue, when you think about a song that you haven't heard in a long time and suddenly it plays on the radio. Of course, throughout history, there have been recorded incidents of premonitions, that are far more compelling than predicting a phone call or a song on the radio. The website Listverse listed some of the more famous examples from history. So let's dive into a couple from there before we get into the main story of today's episode. During World War II, evacuations from London to surrounding small towns and villages were the order of the day. Mona Miller and her young children were no exception, as they were evacuated to Babacombe in Devon. While these precautions were necessary, Mona couldn't shake the feeling that she and her children were in the wrong place. Sure enough, while they were happier there, Mona didn't feel any safer. For four months, Mona spent each day in Devon with a little voice in the back of her head telling her that they needed to return to London. She resisted knowing that London was being bombed. But somehow something was telling her London was safer at that point in time. One morning she awoke knowing she could no longer postpone the inevitable. She and her children had to go back to London. They left on a Saturday, late in 1942. A few days after their arrival in London, a letter came from Devon. Mona's friend wrote that the day after they left, three bombs had been dropped on Devon, one demolishing the house Mona and her kids stayed in and killed the neighbours on both sides. 
On the night of April the 5th, 1936, Mary Hudgens Evans had a disturbing dream. In the dream, she was visited by her deceased mother, who had only one thing to tell her. I'm coming for you. When Mary awoke the next morning, she told her husband, My mother came for me. She went on to say that her husband would now be responsible for raising their only child. Mary then went to work in the offices of the Wright's Ice Cream Parlour in Gainesville. Just after 8am, a deadly series of 17 tornadoes struck the south, with one wreaking havoc in Gainesville. A few minutes before the tornadoes touched down, Mary phoned her husband to tell him goodbye for the last time. Shortly after, Mary Hudgens Evans died. More than 200 others also lost their lives, with a further 1,600 injured. Premonitions range from random people having premonitions of famous historical events and disasters to the stories that we hear on the podcast on a weekly basis. Premonitions that are more personal and contained. Our story today centres around an event that shocked a nation and the man that subsequently set up the Premonitions Bureau in its aftermath. Kathy Middleton had had premonitions all her life. Sometimes they made sense to her and sometimes they didn't. When she was eight, she watched a fried egg rise out of the pan and float in the air. She was extremely excited about the event and told everyone what had happened. Her mother, Annie, was perturbed by the event and consulted a friend who was a psychic. The psychic suggested that it was a bad sign, that someone close to the family was going to die. Annie's best friend died in the coming weeks. Another time, when she was just 11 years old, Kathy had this overwhelming urge to contact her music teacher. She pestered her parents until they allowed her to contact him. He had overdosed on poison in his apartment. In 1933, the Middleton family, who had been living in America, returned to England. During the Blitz of World War II, Kathy was due to attend a St. Patrick's Day dance with her friend. They were determined to attend, despite the risk of nighttime raids from the German planes. En route, Kathy was overcome with the feeling that something terrible was going to happen and convinced her friend to return home. The dance hall was hit by a bomb that night. Kathy's mother Annie had had an infant son that she had left in France many years before. After Annie died, Kathy decided that she would attempt to track down her half-brother. Throughout her life, she had an overwhelming belief that her half-brother lived in a small, pretty cottage by a river in France. In 1962, she found him, living in a small house next to the river Sarth. On the night of the 20th of October 1966, Kathy went to bed as normal but she struggled to sleep. She felt restless and she couldn't settle. At 6am, she woke with a start. She was gasping and choking and had this feeling that the house had fallen in on top of her, like the walls were caving in. She had this ominous sense that something terrible was about to happen. She informed her lodger of the feelings that she had over a morning cup of tea. She knew something bad was going to happen, but she had no idea what it was. If Kathy had known what was about to happen, it probably would have made no difference to the outcome. Miles away in South Wales, there was a village. Overlooking the village was a mountain, and on the side of the mountain was a colliery. Men worked on the mountain, mining for coal, and as they mined, they produced waste. This waste included boiler ash, general rubbish, discarded coal, and slurry. This waste was heaped into tips on the mountainside. Huge cones of waste towered above the village, and when a tip became too full and perilous, a new tip would be created. Tip number seven had been started in Easter 1958, and by 1966 the tip towered 111 feet above the slope. It had slipped twice. 
On the morning of the 21st of October, the colliery workers had noticed that tip number seven had begun to slide. They sent a worker out to investigate and he promptly decided that the tip could take no more and it needed to close. The worker watched in horror as the tip inexplicably seemed to rise into the air. He couldn't understand what he was seeing. But under the tip, after weeks of heavy rain, water had begun to swell. In what seemed like a matter of seconds, the tip had crumbled careening down the mountain and onto the village of Aberfan below. At 9.15am, the wave of coal, ash and rubble covered the Pent Glass Junior School. School had started at 9am. 145 people lost their lives in this incident. 116 of them were children, mostly between the ages of 7 and 10. The rescue effort was monumental, and among the hordes of people who arrived on the scene was Dr. John Barker, a psychiatrist who was working on a book about whether it was possible to be scared to death. According to an article in the New Yorker, this fascination had begun when he read a letter in the British Medical Journal about the death of a 43-year-old woman in Labrador in Canada. The patient, Mrs. A.B., the wife of a fur trapper and the mother of five children, had been admitted to a hospital in the small town of Northwest River to undergo minor surgery to help her with incontinence. The operation, a repair of her vaginal wall, was completed within an hour. Shortly after she regained consciousness, however, Mrs. A.B. complained of a pain on her left side and went into shock. Her blood pressure collapsed and she quickly died. A post-mortem revealed that she had suffered an adrenal hemorrhage, a rare failure of the adrenal glands, but had no underlying illnesses. Afterwards, doctors at the hospital learned that as a child, Mrs. A.B. had been told by a fortune teller that she would die at the age of 43. Her birthday had been the previous week, and she had confided to her sister and to a nurse at the hospital that she was sure she would not survive. These fears were not known to us at the time of the operation, the doctors wrote. We would be grateful to hear from any reader who has experience of a patient dying under similar circumstances. Barker was intrigued. He believed that he had treated at least two men during his career whose extreme agitation had either killed them or hastened their demise. Medicine seemed only partly able to explain what had happened. In 1942, Walter Cannon, the head of physiology at Harvard Medical School, had used the phrase voodoo death to describe a potential biological mechanism by which someone could be frightened to death. An overload of the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal glands. Cannon confined his research to what he referred to at the time as primitive people and black magic. But Barker believed that the phenomenon could exist in Western societies too. He contacted the doctors in Canada and exchanged letters about the case in the BMJ, in which he proposed foreknowledge and extrasensory perception as valid subjects for modern psychiatry. Where Cannon had been tentative, Barker's letters were confident and confrontational. What is now unfamiliar tends to be inadmissible and is therefore just not accepted, he wrote. Thus, for generations, the earth was traditionally regarded as flat. Barker had been following the Abervan disaster and had heard a story that a boy had fled the primary school and later died of shock and he was keen to investigate. As Barker moved through the crowds of people that had gathered, he began to hear strange stories about the incident. He was a member for the Society for Psychical Research and was interested in precognition, so he naturally paid attention. He heard stories of dreams and feelings that people had had the night before the incident. One eight-year-old little boy named Paul Davies drew a picture the night before the incident. His mother had only found it under his bed afterwards. He had drawn an image of the hillside, 
with masses of people digging in dark rubble. It was titled The End. He died the following morning in the avalanche. Errol May Jones was 10 years old and in the weeks leading up to the event she told her mother that there was no need to worry as she was not afraid to die. Her mother was confused as to why her happy and joyful daughter was discussing death and dismissed it as a childhood phase. But what is most striking is what she said the day before the disaster. According to a statement written by local minister Glanant Jones and signed by Errol May's parents, the day before the disaster she said to her mother, Mummy, let me tell you about my dream last night. Her mother answered gently, Darling, I've no time. Tell me again later. The child replied, No, mummy, you must listen. I dreamt I went to school and there was no school there. Something black had come down all over it. Errol May died the next day. Barker had an idea. He wrote to Peter Fairley, who was the science editor of London's Evening Standard, and asked him to help publicise the idea. Barker, with the help of Fairley, wrote an article requesting that anyone who had a premonition of the Aberfan disaster to get in contact. They asked for dreams, waking visions, feelings and feelings of telepathy at the time of the disaster. One of the people who wrote in to the Evening Standard was Miss Cathy Middleton. On the morning of the incident, she had, of course, experienced feelings of choking and suffocation and the feeling that her house was falling down around her. She now believed this was a premonition of the disaster. Barker received 76 responses to his call-out. 76 people believed enough that they had had a premonition of the Aberfan disaster that they made the effort to pick up a pen and write a letter. A 63-year-old man who lived in a village on the edge of the Lancashire Moors had dreamt two nights before the incident that he was in a Welsh town, one he had not been to for many, many years. In his letter, he described how in this dream he was attempting to buy a book and he was standing in front of a machine with letters. He wrote, Now I've never seen a computer. This may have been one, I just don't know. Then, all of a sudden, while I was standing by this big machine, I looked up and saw Abervan written, as if suspended in white lettering against a black background. This seemed to last some minutes. Then I turned and looked the other way, and I saw through a window rows of houses, and everything seemed derelict and desolate. He didn't recognise the place name. He didn't even recognise the word fully as a place name. He had no idea that the dream was significant until he saw the story on the news. Miles away in Plymouth, a 43-year-old woman had a vision at a spiritualist church the night before the disaster. She told the congregation that she had a vision of coal hurtling down a mountain. She saw a Welsh miner and an old schoolhouse. She saw a small child terrified and grief-stricken. She saw a large rescue effort. And the next night, on the news, she saw that same little boy, terrified and grief-stricken. Another man spent the week before the event feeling completely and utterly convinced that there was going to be a national disaster on Friday. A young woman spent the week repeatedly smelling the smell of decaying flesh, the smell of death. It plagued her. It haunted her. She asked co-workers and family members and there was no one else who could smell it. Her co-workers verified that she asked if anyone could smell it about an hour before the disaster happened. And about 15 minutes after the school had been buried, her co-workers verified that she stood up, pale and breathless, and declared that something awful had happened. There had been some terrible disaster. At this point... No one outside of Aberfan knew what had happened. In all of the submissions to Barker's appeal, over 20 of them were deemed to be compelling enough to warrant further attention. Five weeks after Barker had sent out his appeal, 
He was standing in the green room of a popular late night television show, The Frost Program, and he wasn't alone. He was gathered with the people who had had these premonitions of the Aberfan disaster. They were due to make their television appearance, but their moment in the spotlight never came. It was a combination of things. The first guest on the show was a poet and was compelling and it was great television and he remained on screen for the full 40 minutes. There were also concerns about putting these so-called seers on television. It was so soon after the disaster, it seemed insensitive to discuss it in this way right now. And also the people in the room were described as not being weirdos as such, but they certainly were an interesting bunch. And perhaps more quietly, there were concerns that the premonitions were actually quite flimsy and would be easily picked apart. Barker was furious, but it did spark the beginning of something else. His anger and frustration at the situation led to the beginning of the Premonitions Bureau. With the help of the newspaper The Evening Standard and that same journalist Peter Fairley, Barker set up a space where the public were invited to send in their premonitions. The view was, ultimately, to try and help predict and avoid future disasters. Each report was carefully catalogued, time-stamped, and an 11-point system was set up to categorise the premonitions. Five points for unusualness, five points for accuracy, one point for timeliness. In theory, the idea was that if enough premonitions came in that seemed to outline a similar event, then perhaps a date, place and time for this event could be extrapolated. The Premonitions Bureau launched on the 4th of January 1967. The day of the launch was a Wednesday, and according to Sam Knight, writing for The New Yorker, shortly before 9am, Donald Campbell, a 46-year-old serial speed record holder, died while attempting to break his own world water speed record on Coniston Water in the Lake District. On the second run, travelling at around 300 miles per hour, Campbell's bright blue jet-powered boat somersault and killed him. Campbell had been a superstitious man, who was afraid of the colour green and played solitaire to pass the time. The day before he died, he had turned over an ace of spades followed by the Queen. He told reporters that Mary Queen of Scots had drawn the same cards before her execution in 1587. I know that one of my family is going to get the chop, Campbell had said. I pray to God it is not me. During its first year in operation, the Premonitions Bureau recorded 469 predictions. Alan Hencher, a switchboard operator, predicted that a plane would crash and 123 people would be killed, but it was possible that the number would be 124. 30 days later, a plane did indeed crash in Cyprus. 124 people were killed on impact. Kathy Middleton, who was involved in the original Abervan predictions, wrote in about a vision she had had of an astronaut. She had seen in this vision that the astronaut was petrified. Earlier, the same day that she had had this vision, Vladimir Komarov was killed when his capsule crash-landed in Russia. The incident was not officially reported until later. Middleton also had premonitions about Robert Kennedy. She initially sent a warning for his safety on the 11th of March 1968, and reportedly she called the Premonitions Bureau three times the day before his assassination on the 5th of June, 1968. Both Hencher and Middleton sent in other predictions of death too, of Dr. Barker's death. They believed that the end was coming soon for him. In a memo that was found among his documents, he wrote... It would be wrong for me to say that I was not frightened by a prediction of this nature. I intend to keep a diary from now on and to record my reactions to this on a daily basis. I suppose anybody who plays about with precognition in this way, to some extent, sticks his neck out and must accept what he gets. 
The important thing, though, is for this information to be recorded so that if anything does happen, it should cause some interest and may stimulate others to continue in this important work. Of course, it is possible that these predictions, as with the others, may not be fulfilled in a literal way. It would be curious and remarkable indeed if Mr. Hencher could bring off a psychic hat-trick. Having recently written a book on people who were scared to death, I am perhaps beginning to feel what this would be like. He was a young man, in his late thirties. He had a history of issues with stress, and he died of a brain embolism in August 1968. On the morning before, Kathy Middleton woke up, choking and crying out for help. The Premonitions Bureau closed with Barker's death, 18 months after it had been established. In the 18 months of the Bureau's existence, 723 predictions were collected and 18 recorded as hits, with 12 of those coming from only two correspondents, Hensher and Middleton. No disasters were prevented. I just bloody loved this story for so many reasons. First of all, I think it's important to point out that Barker was a really interesting man and he was very obviously interested in things like premonitions and whether or not people could be scared to death and various other sort of fringe medical conundrums and he spoke about them with a great confidence it would seem whereas a lot of psychologists psychiatrists doctors etc might have been quietly interested in these things Barker was very publicly interested in these things I do think it's also important to point out that he was a man of his time and he was a proponent of very problematic mental health treatments and therapies. Like he was very into aversion therapy for issues such as gambling addictions and alcohol addictions. And he particularly liked to use aversion therapy in conjunction with shocking the patients with electronic waves so by that I mean during the aversion therapy when he would be trying to create an aversion to alcohol or gambling or in some cases like a particular person if somebody was having an affair they would sometimes be prescribed like aversion therapy to stop them from wanting to have sex or wanting to have an affair with that person and they would do that by using electric shocks to shock the person to change their way of thinking about alcohol or whatever it was that was trying to be cured um quote unquote and the thinking was that if you showed a person pictures of the thing that they were addicted to and you shocked them you would create like a negative association and therefore cure the person and by today's standards aversion therapy is often seen as incredibly problematic and controversial and I think there isn't actually any scientific evidence that it works as it were so I do think that if you are somebody who is going to go and look up Dr John Barker it is important to keep in mind that he was also like I said a man of his time he also worked in a an institution that was incredibly dark and problematic and reading about it made me really sad I didn't include any of that in this episode because it wasn't relevant to the story of Abervan and the Premonitions Bureau but it's obviously relevant to the life of Dr Barker and he just is like I said a really interesting man to read about oh and to remind you my information for all of this episode came from the book The Premonitions Bureau by Sam Knight and also some articles that Sam Knight also wrote elsewhere So leaving Dr. Barker aside in terms of some of his problematic practices, I do think the idea of a premonitions bureau is really interesting. I think particularly a premonitions bureau that is manned by a psychiatrist. That intrigues me. And to go back to the beginning of this episode or the beginning of this story, I do think that premonitions are something that everybody has experience of in one way or another, whether it's direct experience or whether somebody you know had a premonition of something. Now, whether you believe those premonitions are indeed premonitions or their coincidences is kind of irrelevant because 
at the base of it all we've all experienced something like that whether it's thinking of somebody and then your phone rings and then it's that person or thinking of a song on the radio and that song comes on the radio and you haven't heard of radios and you're like weird and the first premonition story that I took from Listverse which is about Mona Miller and moving her kids to Devon during the Blitz where it was supposed to be safe you know that was the thought you take yourself and your kids out into the countryside and you will be safe and yet she has this crazy impulsive compulsive thought that she needs to go back to London she'll be safer in London and the day she leaves three bombs are dropped on Devon flattening the house that she was living in and killing the neighbours on both sides and then all the way in the USA this woman dreams that her mother is her deceased mother is coming together and she wakes up knowing she is going to die and in terms of that second story where Mary Hudgens Evans passed away had that dream I wonder if as humans we have this sort of maybe an imperceptible ability to detect changes in the atmosphere or changes in the earth if that makes sense like did she did she have those feelings of distress or those feelings that something was wrong or something was going to happen because somehow her body had detected that these tornadoes were coming I don't know if that makes sense so to give like a kind of personal example because I I do like to make everything about me many years ago there was an earthquake a very small earthquake in Kent where I live and I woke up in the middle of the night no way I just knew I, I woke up and thought something is wrong something something is about to happen and I don't know what that is and it was really quiet I remember it just was deathly quiet and I was like oh my god something something terrible is about to happen and next thing there was this earthquake and I've never experienced an earthquake before so I was like what the fuck just happened so there was this earthquake and when the earthquake was over there you know all the dogs and the the birds everything everything went crazy everybody was barking I love the way I just said everybody was barking like all the people started barking no I just mean the dogs the dogs were barking the birds were all chirping up a frenzy and it was a very strange experience and I I did feel like afterwards I, I thought wow did something in my body feel that something was going to happen you know I've never I'm not somebody who has ever had any anything premonition-y before or since but that particular incident was very very strange And while maybe there might be a tentative link between that and premonitions of natural disasters, it doesn't explain people's premonitions like Mona's premonition when she was moved to Devon where she presumably thought she would be safe and then was like, no, I need to go back to London and then her house was flattened. Of course, the overriding thought would be that if you are particularly in the West, and you are in the countryside you are going to be safe from the bombings but if you're in London you are not going to be safe from the bombings and she defied all of that because of an instinct that she needed to be back in London and then you have Kathy Middleton who seems to have had premonitions all her life from the time that she watched an egg rise out of the pan and I really like the way she described that because she said you know she was eight she watched this fried egg rise out of the pan she was so excited she told everybody she went to school told her teacher told all her friends everyone was like okay Kathy that's that's kind of a weird thing to be talking about and she seemed to have numerous incidents in her life where she had these feelings premonitions that seemed to have serious real world implications and interestingly both Kathy and Hensher who we talked about later in this episode they both described feeling their premonitions the same way that they would feel nauseous they would get a really really horrible headache unlike any other headache that felt like a sort of a band being tightened around their head and then they would know a premonition was coming and they both kind of independently described it like that which is interesting I would also like to give a word of warning you know reading about the Aberfan disaster was really really heart-wrenching stuff it it was it was a tough tough read so if you are somebody who is feeling particularly fragile at the moment and you're thinking oh I might read a bit more about this Aberfan disaster I didn't know about it be warned it is it is really heart-wrenching stuff I had a I had a good cry multiple times reading about the actual the actual disaster itself and 
the subsequent cleanup and the rescue efforts that went on afterwards. It just, it is really, really heart-wrenching stuff. And I think it's fascinating that people, lots of people all over the country, including children in the, in the village, seem to have known that this was going to happen in some way or another. Like, obviously, people had dreams and feelings and couldn't figure them out, didn't know what they meant, and then afterwards thought, oh my God, I had a premonition of the Abervan disaster. And these children who, you know, Paul Davies, who drew that picture before the incident, Errol Mae Jones, who was like, I, you know, I, I'm going to die soon, but I'm not worried about it. And then dreaming that she went to school and there was no school there. I think that even if you are a hardened skeptic, these, these, incidents are fascinating even from a psychological perspective even if you don't believe these are premonitions psychologically it is really interesting i also think it's really interesting that in all of the predictions that were collected at the premonitions bureau that the vast majority of hits that were seen as being accurate to some degree came from hencher and kathy middleton two people who described the physical effects of these premonitions in the same way and two people who contacted Barker to say I'm worried and I think that you are going to die and because I've spent a lot of time obviously reading this book during the week and thinking about what information I could extrapolate from it and condense into an episode and while I was I was out running I was sort of mulling through all of my thoughts and ideas about this in my in my brain And it felt to me like before any of these big events, these big disasters, these huge things that happen that impact communities and impact countries and sometimes impact continents, it almost feels like the world takes a deep breath, like that calm before the storm. And somehow in that calm, in that breath, some people get get a glimpse into what is about to happen. And they might not necessarily understand that glimpse and it might only make sense afterwards. And maybe the glimpse doesn't make any difference. But it almost feels like some people are just more tuned in to that deep breath than everybody else. And of course, it would be easy for me to sit here and go, all of these premonitions were true. They are supernatural events. They are factually supernatural events. But we have to be balanced here. We have to give both sides of the story. And my my sort of vaguely, pretentiously poetic idea about the world taking a deep breath is all well and good until you look at some of the issues with premonitions and even some of the issues with the premonitions around Abervan, for example. So one of the first issues that is widely pointed out about the Premonitions Bureau and the reverence given to the Abervan premonitions is that Premonitions reported after the event can't really be considered good, solid evidence. There is no proof that anybody had this premonition before the event. Now, in some instances, we saw that people asked their co-workers, hey, I'm getting this weird smell. Can you smell that? Or people stood up in the break room and said something awful is is after happening and not realising that the Abervan disaster had happened. But for the most part, when we talk about premonitory experiences, they are generally reported after the fact. And we can't be sure that this isn't just, I think Wikipedia referred to it as mental confabulations constructed after the fact, which is quite a nice phrase. Basically saying, we don't know that this is a jumble of different thoughts and memories and timelines that have been mixed together to form this premonition. And I don't think that people would do this purposefully. I think that the likelihood is that people do this subconsciously. One of the other criticisms about premonitions is that details of a premonition account can easily be altered in order to make the story fit the narrative better and I have to say when I was researching for this episode I even found inconsistencies in how stories were being reported from Sam Knight's book so stories about predictions that have been kind of called into the premonitions bureau were reported slightly differently in different sources and actually those slight differences 
kind of make a huge difference. So for example, the man who called in, so Hensher, who called in and said there's going to be a plane disaster and 123 people, perhaps 124 people are going to die. And a lot of the sources say a week later, there was this plane crash and 124 people died. Or nine days later, there was a plane crash and 124 people died. Actually, it was 30 days later, there was a plane crash and 124 people died. And the thing is that while that, you know, it seems like an inconsequential difference, but in terms of timeliness, which is which is one of the factors in the points system in the Premonitions Bureau, in terms of timeliness, and also in terms of gravity of the prediction. I think as humans, the sooner something happens afterwards, the more credence we give it. So I did wonder if sometimes people made the time between the premonition and the actual event slightly shorter in order to make the story more compelling and one of the most common criticisms of these premonitions is that they may be interpreted differently after an event to kind of better fit the details of the event so you know Kathy Middleton for example she had this this feeling where she felt suffocated and choked and she felt like the walls were closing in on her. Of course that could be interpreted in a number of different ways. From a very cynical perspective you could say that sounds like a panic attack or an anxiety attack. However you can see that in retrospect you could look at that feeling and go that was a prediction of the Aberfan disaster because of you know the feelings of suffocation and choking and the walls caving in around me. You know, similarly with the people who reported that they just had feelings all week that something terrible was going to happen on Friday. And I'm sure lots of terrible things happen every Friday throughout history. But it doesn't necessarily validate that that feeling was a prediction of the Aberfan disaster. To me, it feels kind of similar to when a psychic would say, you know, there's a tall man looking out for you and he seems to be somebody from your family that has passed away. And you know that's that's vague enough that you can apply it to your own life and and similarly i feel like it wouldn't take much rigorous scrutiny for some of these predictions to kind of be picked apart and be ultimately seen as potentially somewhat vague and then only accurate in retrospect i can understand why the tv show was like oh i don't think we should do this in the end because i think I think the people probably would have been ridiculed, unfortunately. And not to be a big Debbie Downer on predictions, okay? Because I think predictions are incredibly interesting. I do think it's compelling that Hensher and Middleton were the two people who seem to consistently give premonitions about various things. And they were the two people that called up Barker and said, we're worried about you and we think that you're going to die. I think Barker was right to be freaked by the whole thing. I also think it is a weird, weird coincidence that our story started with Barker researching people being scared to death. That's what led him to Aberfan. And then that memo that was found among his documents being like, I've spent a long time searching for people who've been scared to death. And now these people have told me that my death is imminent. And I think I'm beginning to feel what it would feel like to be scared to death. That to me is pretty interesting. I think there is also one more point that I think is important to make before we finish this episode. Coincidences do happen. (laughs) Do I think that every premonition that happens is down to coincidence? No. Do I think that some of them might be? Yeah, potentially. I hope that this episode has warped your brain as much as it warped mine because I have, I have dived in and out of feeling like these are all premonitions 100% these people knew this was about to happen to feeling like these are all coincidences that's all it is and we need to see these coincidences as premonitions to to make us feel slightly more in control of these uncontrollable awful things and I've been left with the grand feeling of I haven't a clue what I think about this Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you have a story that you would like to send in, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. And just to remind you, the information from today's episode came from the book The Premonitions Bureau by Sam Knight. I sound like I'm I'm being paid 
to promote this book. I'm not. It is a very good and interesting book and I would recommend if you are interested in more information about the Premonitions Bureau, that book is a, is kind of the ultimate place to find all the information. And to be clear, all of the information from this episode came from literally one part of the book. So there is a lot of information in there to dive into. If you would like, you can check out the website, reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. Hey, it's Paige DeSorbo from Giggly Squad. High quality fashion without the price tag. Say hello to Quince. I'm snagging high-end essentials like cozy cashmere sweaters, sleek leather jackets, fine jewelry, and so much more, with Quince being 50 to 80% less than similar brands. And they partner with factories that prioritize safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing. I love that. Luxury quality within reach. Go to quince.com slash style to get free shipping and 365-day returns on your next order. Quince.com slash style.